Tonight, Facebook improves its search function. Amazon tests bike messenger deliveries. And which are the most disruptive technologies of our time? Tech News Tonight is next. This is Twit. This is Tech News Tonight, episode 230 for Monday, December 8th, 2014. This episode is brought to you by Squarespace, which recently launched the latest version of its platform, Squarespace 7, which has a completely redesigned interface, integrations with Getty Images and Google Apps, new templates, and an incredible feature called Cover Pages. Try the new Squarespace at squarespace.com and enter the offer code TECHNIGHT at checkout and you'll get 10% off. Hi, everybody. I'm Sarah Lane, and happy Monday. Let's get right into today's tech feed. Two full years after Facebook introduced semantic search, which is searches like my friends who live in Boston or friends who like this particular kind of music, that sort of thing. The company's graph search is now rolling out on iOS, at least in the U.S., as well as a new keyword search option for surfacing friends' older newsfeed posts. However, if you think about a more general search for a particular doctor or a type of food, could actually surface results that compete more closely with Google's search results or recent mentions or news articles by friends could be kind of similar to how search works on Twitter. Facebook says for now, there won't be any ads on Facebook's mobile search or any new keyword ads. And privacy settings aren't changing either. Keyword search will only bring up content that's shared with you, like posts by friends or that friends have commented on. Not public posts are ones by pages. Eventually, though, Facebook does want to surface public posts as well. Better search for all, which is... I don't know. At least on Facebook, it's kind of welcome. The battle for the best internet talent is continuing to heat up. The Wall Street Journal is reporting that both Facebook and video startup Vessel have been trying to lure popular YouTube creators away from YouTube and onto rival services. This is according to people familiar with the discussions. In response, Google is reportedly offering some of its top video makers bonuses to sign multi-year deals if they agree to post content exclusively on YouTube for a certain amount of time before putting it elsewhere. The bonuses could be tied to how well videos perform, but YouTube is making a wide range of offers to counter rivals, according to sources. Vessel, if you're not familiar with it, was founded by former Hulu CEO Jason Killar and plans a subscription video service and is aggressively courting YouTube stars in recent weeks. According to sources, three people who have been approached by Vessel say that the company wants artists to post videos exclusively on its service for up to three days, which is part of its plan to offer subscribers an advanced look at short form video that's very popular. One of those people said that Vessel offered to pay in advance based on how well the creator's uh, videos have performed on YouTube. In other YouTube news, pardon me for a second, <clears throat> so sorry. In other YouTube news, the service's new audio library launched today and allows uploaders who use copyrighted music to see exactly what will happen to their videos before they upload them. This is actually a really nice feature. YouTube's content ID system will automatically try to figure out if you're using any copyrighted music in it. And if you are, artists and labels can then choose to either mute that audio or block the video from being seen or even monetize the video by running ads against it. Now, this doesn't solve the issue of takedown notices, which often is an argument between creator and person who uploaded, but for the vast majority of people uploading video that might have copyrighted music in there, just checking the rights on a song beforehand is a good tool. YouTube also offers a pretty big selection of royalty-free tracks for uploaders who want to monetize their videos as well. Well, Sony did not have a great couple of weeks, and it's not out of the woods yet either. Earlier today, Sony's PlayStation Gaming Network was knocked offline for more than two hours as a result of an apparent cyber attack. A group calling itself the Lizard Squad claimed responsibility via Twitter. This is the same group who has taken responsibility for at least two other outages earlier this month on Microsoft's Xbox Live network. The latest Sony attack follows the Sony Pictures Entertainment hack from a couple of weeks ago, which was bad. It shut down the corporate network. It surfaced sensitive corporate information like salaries, leaked five films onto the internet, and even included threats against employees and their families. North Korea was suspected in having a hand in those attacks, but the country has officially denied any involvement. The attack against the PlayStation Network appears to be a DDoS or a distributed denial of service attack, which uses a big number of computers usually remotely controlled with malicious software to overwhelm an internet service 
with too much inbound traffic. You guys know what a DDoS is, though. The PlayStation Network has been an ongoing target for hackers. If you remember, back in 2011, Sony shut down the service for about three weeks after the theft of personal information of around 77 million customers. I did not forget. Now, as we mentioned, North Korea has denied hacking Sony Pictures computer systems in retaliation for the Sony movie, The Interview, which includes a plot line about assassinating North Korea's leader, Kim, Kim Jong-un. But the country does call the attack a righteous deed. This was actually in a statement issued Sunday by the official Korean Central News Agency. The movie, The Interview, is still scheduled for release in the U.S. on Christmas Day, December 25th. All right, I'd like to talk about some disruptive technologies, and not in the last year, or even the last two years, but we're gonna go like we're gonna go like a century back. And joining us to help us out is Mark Million, writer and editor over at Bloomberg. Hey, Mark. Hey, Sarah. Good to have you. And in, and in fact, I mean, we're not going to be able to talk about all of them in detail, but it's eighty-five of the most disruptive ideas in our history. Eighty-five. So what? I mean, what, okay, eighty-five. The way I, I I know that lists are cool. This is the sort of thing Lists that great. we've all gotten very used to as far as uh, headlines on the internet. But why 85? Uh, well, Business Week magazine, which Bloomberg owns, is celebrating its 85th anniversary oh, this yeah. month. And so to celebrate, we uh, we put together a list of the 85 biggest ideas and a number of uh, stories and features and media and data visualizations that help sort of show why all of these were so important over the, uh, basically all of our lifetimes. I think 85 years pretty well covers the majority of people who are alive today. So um, many of us were directly affected by a lot of these. And so, um, you know, no surprise, the technology space uh, made a number of showings on the list. Uh, we had microchips at number two, which is, you know, the underpinning of just about everything that we uh, <laughs> that we do today from the technology perspective. Um, Google is at number six, Apple at number 10, Amazon at 20. Um, and then uh, one of my favorites, PowerPoint at number 53. Uh, now, these are disruptive <laughs> ideas, and disruptions aren't all good things. Right. Uh, so PowerPoint, you know, probably the most annoying uh, thing that anyone has to, to deal with if they are sit in business meetings at any point during the day. Mm. Um, but it really has changed the way that that many companies do business. Obviously, if you look through the entire list, not everything would be considered technology, but 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 many of the 85 are, as you mentioned, there's 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 tech related stuff. You've got companies like Twitter and Facebook and and then you've got, you know, Linux and Atari and 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 you know the 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 concept of the modem sound and all of that in there. Now, number one, uh, because I know that anybody who isn't actually looking at this list right now is like, well, what's the number one? And it's the jet engine, which I guess when you think about it, not only is it a technological feat, but it changed the way that, that we all behave. We were able to go places that we were never able to go before. It's pretty interesting. How did, how did jet engine turn into the, the number one just because nothing else could touch it? Yeah, you know, the... Uh the editors on the magazine had a had a lengthy discussion, particularly about the top ten. You know, there was um, a lot of debate over which had the biggest impact on the world and on business. You know, obviously the birth control pill has has been an extremely important um, development yeah. and uh, very concept and disruptive actually. Microchips, the jet engine, though. You know, I think everyone decided that it's it's made the world smaller. Um, it's, uh, you know, affects just about everything we do that, you know, uh, business executives can make their way to Asia in, in 12 hours and, um, and reach a part of the world that, uh, they would have never seen before. Um, and our, uh, our technology writer, Ashley Vance, uh, did an, an excellent feature on why the jet engine is so important, um, you know, developed in, uh, in the fifties and, um, and, and, you know, really came, came about with the first, uh, Pan Atlantic flight in 1958. And so it's, it's not, you know, as new as, uh, as say, uh, Amazon or Google, but um, it's, it's, in our view, the biggest thing that's happened. 
you know, one of the uh, what one of the disruptions uh, was uh, personal fitness, which is attributed to Jane Fonda. Um, I once had a I, I once listened to a Jane Fonda cassette tape over and over, where you had to like flip it over. You know that that was my personal fitness. But it's interesting. You think, okay, well, that's not technological. But now personal fitness is all you know, all we can talk about as far as, you know, the coolest apps and, and, and smart watches. And it's interesting how the two have actually converged into certainly a technical topic at this point. Yeah, it wasn't really a, it wasn't really a mainstream thing until um, Jane Fonda and the like came along. Now you've got yoga and CrossFit are all, um, you know, things that people uh, use as, as ways to have social interactions and... Mm-hmm. Um, and it's made the world a uh, healthier and uh, and a place and extended people's lifespans. And so that's equally as disruptive as um, as some of the other things on our list, like the smartphone at number seventy eight. You know, the smartphone is number seventy eight, but I will point out that kitty litter, which was developed in <laughs> nineteen fifty four, is number seventy three. I go ahead and yeah. put that right there. Yeah, well, we know that the internet loves cats, so we had to find a way to get them on the list somewhere. (laughs) Oh, tidy cat. Mark Millian is a writer-editor over at Bloomberg and often a guest here on TN2. Always good to have you, Mark. Uh, Before you go, remind folks where they can keep up with you. Uh, Yeah, check us out at Bloomberg.com slash tech. Excellent. Have a wonderful week. All right, you too. Coming up on our show, Amazon is testing bike messenger delivery. We will tell you more about where and when you might see it. And publishers are trying to sell books via Twitter. Hey, why not? But first, let's thank Squarespace.com for sponsoring this episode of TN2. Squarespace just recently launched their latest version of the Squarespace platform. It's called Squarespace 7. has a completely redesigned interface, makes it easy to create your own professional website or online portfolio. And as somebody who's been using Squarespace for many years, and I've I've seen you know a lot of uh, 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 of different options roll out, Squarespace Seven just makes it easier than ever to be up and running in no time at all with something that looks really really nice. You can live edit on one screen. That that means you're you're toggling back and forth between different views a lot less. You can preview designs in device mode. That's very important. If you've got a, a a site that you know people are going to be accessing on a variety of different kinds of screens, mobile devices, smartphones, tablets, all that good stuff, you also have instant access to professional stock photography that comes from Getty Images. Ten bucks each, bring in Getty Images and instantly transform your site into something that is 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 full of professional photographs by actual professionals. Squarespace is also designed category specific templates for a variety of industries. Hey, maybe you are in a band and you want to let people know what, you know, what your tour looks like and you want to embed some videos and some audio clips. All that stuff can be part of a template that's already pre-made for you. Maybe you're a chef. Maybe you want to show off pictures of your food. Maybe you do a lot of, I don't know, watercolor and you'd like to sell some of your creations on your website. You can do that because e-commerce is available at all subscription plan levels. You can also accept donations as well. Plans start at just $8 a month, which is very affordable. It includes a free domain name if you sign up for a year, and it also includes hosting. It is truly an all-in-one service. Mobile ready. When you're on the go, Squarespace has a variety of mobile apps that are true extensions of your website. You can make changes. You can monitor comments. And uh, the new Note and Blog apps are new on Android as well. Like I mentioned, hosting is included. Squarespace takes care of the hosting so you don't have to. And you can start a free two-week trial with no credit card at all. It will cost you zero just to build your website, put something together for two weeks, and be amazed. When it's time to sign up for Squarespace, make sure to use the offer code TECHNIGHT. That's T-E-C-H-N-I-G-H-T, and you'll get 10% off. And to begin using Squarespace 7 as an existing customer, just go to the settings tab and activate all those new features. There are new features, and they are great. We thank Squarespace for the support of Tech News Tonight. Squarespace, start here and go anywhere. On to a few more stories that we're following today. The Hachette Book Group wants to know how author tweets might result in more book sales. Hachette announced today that it's partnering with Gumroad. If you haven't heard of Gumroad, that's a company that allows creators to sell products directly to their followers, social media followers, 
via Twitter. Hachette's first batch includes authors like uh, Amanda Palmer, also a musician who has more than 1 million Twitter followers, former astronaut and YouTube star Chris Hadfield, who has 1.2 million followers, and The Onion magazine, iconic covers that transformed an undeserving world, which is a book from the satire site The Onion, which has 6.6 .6 million followers. If it works out, I think we should expect a lot more of these types of tweets. Amazon is testing plans to offer deliveries within an hour in New York City using bike messengers, a person familiar with the test tells the Wall Street Journal. Now, recently, bike messengers working for Amazon have been seen leaving out the back of a building in Manhattan's West 34th Street. That's where Amazon just signed a 17-year building lease. The company has reportedly been holding time trials with messengers from at least three different courier services to assemble its own delivery feet, fleet rather. They have feet. That's how they pedal. Based on speed and their attention to detail because you don't want a courier that's going to drop the eggs. Messengers are said to be paid around $15 per hour and work eight-hour shifts. Video game visionary Ralph H. Baer, who invented and patented the first home video game system, died on Saturday at his home in Manchester, New Hampshire, at the age of 92. Mr. Baer and his employer, Sanders Associates, filed for the first video game patent back in 1971. It was granted to them in April of 1973 and claimed quite a monopoly on any product that included a domestic television with circuits capable of producing and controlling dots on a screen. Wow, that is quite a patent. Sanders Associates licensed its system to Magnavox, which began selling it as Odyssey in the summer of 1972. This is a little bit before my time, but you might have had an Odyssey. It was the first home video game console, and it sold 130,000 units in its first year on the market. Magnavox then sued Atari in 1974 for infringement, which ended with Atari settling for $700,000 to become Odyssey's second licensee. Over the next 20 years, Magnavox went on to sue dozens more companies, winning more than $100 million. Ah, patent wars. Finally... U.S. President Barack Obama hosted a computer science workshop at the White House earlier today. And now we have a new milestone in American history because Obama is now the first U.S. president to write a computer program, at least one that we know of. Now, before you get too impressed, it's not very impressive at all. The president used Google's blocky tool to put together a tiny segment of code that draws a square. But hey, it's a start. It's not really useful, but certainly indicative of how important programming and education in programming has become. A lot more information on this workshop and other events is at hourofcode.com slash US. And that's it for this edition of Tech News Tonight. Thanks for being here. You can subscribe to the show at twit.tv slash TN2. You can write us with feedback at TN2 at twit.tv. And of course, you can watch live every day at 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern time. Don't miss our morning news show, Tech News Today. That's tomorrow and every weekday at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. Hope you can join us for both, in fact. I'm Sarah Lane, and thanks for watching. Bandwidth for Tech News Tonight is brought to you by cashfly.com.